to four. Do you have a gardening problem? We can help you with that. A program dedicated to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make that grass look a little bit greener, as well as preserving what you grow. We're here to help you with your gardening problem. You're tuned in to Garden Talk Radio. You're listening to the most informational-packed hour of garden-focused radio in the country and on the Internet with your host, husband and wife team Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Welcome to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging projects, visit powerplanter.com. Thank you for taking time to join us on the program today, whether you're listening to us on one of the 16 radio stations that are broadcasting our program here in 2020 through our radio app, through our website, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com, under the Season 4 tab at the top of the page, or through a podcast replay or in-studio video replay or other means. We thank you for taking time out of your day. I'm Joy Baird. I'm your host. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner. Holly Baird. This program is for you, about you, to help your garden grow better, to maintain your landscape, get your trees to look a little bit better, and your grass to be a little greener, as well as preserving what you grow. There's a couple of ways in which you can get a hold of us. Uh, they're very easy to do. If you have the Internet, you can send us an email at gardentalkradio at gmail.com. That's gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Or you can uh, jam your fingers in the phone now, later, tomorrow, next week, whenever you've got a question. Uh, we've got our lines open 24-7, so if we can't get to you right now during the program, we will get a hold of you when you leave us a message. And that number is 1-800-927-SHOW, 1-800-927-SHOW. Well, we've got a big show for you. We're going to talk about in segment one what to buy in bulk or what not to buy in bulk and what to do with it once you got it in bulk. And then uh, freezer meal tips and our guest will be outdoors and green living guru Rob Greenfield will be with us and we'll get to your garden questions. So Holly, let's get in the program and let's talk about bulk buying materials. And maybe because of the situation we all live in, people were um, buying far too many rolls of toilet paper or um, hand sanitizer or other items uh, not really the bulk type of material in which we're talking about. We're going to kind of lean towards maybe more the the food aspect of it, but uh, we're going to cover a lot of uh, territory in this. Right. So we're talking about um, about food, like you said, edible edible bulk. And I know that a lot of people at one point maybe felt a little bit vulnerable or confused or conflicted or whatever. Um, so this is, this is something that you could apply to any time in your life. So maybe you get a warehouse store membership. Maybe you find a really good deal on some hamburger meat or bacon or tofu or whatever. Right. And you want to, you decide that you want to, you want to purchase that. Right. So you have to think to yourself though, first, do and I need this? Do I, do I need this? Will I need this in the next six to eight months? Right. Or will I need it in the next 10 to 14 years? Big difference on what's the best uh, avenue to go there. Right. So that's what you want to do. You want to take into account your family size, your household size, and what you may consume. And you have to take that into account. So if you are a family of five, you're going to consume a lot more than Joey and I who are a family of two. So that's... Um, yeah, so that's something you definitely want to take into account. Whatever you're buying, half and you eat it, whatever. If you don't eat rice and you see this deal on rice and you buy rice. If you don't like rice. <laughs> and here's the thing. <laughs> People will buy things they don't need and don't have the money for because it's on sale. Yeah. Oh, well, it's a back massager. I'll never need it. But it's 37% off regular price. we got to get it. Mm -hmm. People have a difficult time passing up things they don't need just because it's on sale. Just because it's on sale means it's less than the retail price, and if you don't need it, you've just saved all that money because you didn't need to buy it. Right, exactly. So that's something you want to keep in mind. Um, you got to think about your storage space, right? If you, if you live in a small one-bedroom apartment 
and you don't have a lot of storage space, you might be storing that 50 pounds of rice underneath your bed or something. Right. So you got to think about that too. Like, where can I put this? What am I going to do with it? And that's the biggest thing. Even if you are just uh, freezing something, you have to think about your freezer space. If, if, um, or if you say you're to the point where like, I want to freeze a bunch of stuff, maybe you have to get a deep freeze. Yeah, invest in a, in a, in additional appliance that will, in the long run, you can bulk, buy more in bulk or you can freeze more, you know, get it in, in, you know, grow it. And in the long run, it'll pay for itself. But also now, just because, you know, you want a deep freeze, you got to think smart about it. Oh, well, the, the 25 cubic foot is $1,000. That's eight foot long. Yeah, we'll just get that. When really maybe a five cubic foot or a seven cubic foot for 190 or $250 is ideal for what you need. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So that's another thing is keeping that in mind, your freezer space, where you're going to put that. Um, so the other one is is that you have to think about something like flour. If you if you decide to purchase um, some sort of baking, dry goods, whatever, in the flour we get those bugs. What are those called? Uh, weevil. Weevils. Yeah. And they live in your flour. Well, the the the, the eggs. The eggs are there. Mm-hmm. Uh, whenever you harvest the wheat on the farm, um, if you're gonna, you know, you, you if you don't treat the wheat, um, this is an inorganic means. If you don't treat the wheat with this chemical, this um, it's a pill-like material. It's like a giant pill that dissolves over time, okay. and and they ingest the the bugs ingest it in their lungs and it kills them. It's a toxic um, air deal. But anyway, it's like a pesticide. It's a pesticide. Yeah, yeah they breathe it in, and uh, when the eggs hatch, they bre- it breathe the baby ones breathe it in, and they die. So they don't eat the internal portions of the uh, wheat. Uh, the important part of making the wheat. Or the flour is the wheat, so if you have a bunch of wheat with nothing internally inside of it, it's not valuable. It doesn't do any good. You can't make flour out of it. So you uh, put this, you spray the, the area first, and then you drop these pills in. At least this is how we did it. And it's it just a very you know tough, a very strong odor that comes out of it. Uh, but some of this stuff that if you buy in a bag and you let it sit in the cupboard for six, eight months, you're going to see a bunch of dead little brown things. That's the weevil that have not been able to feed on anything. The eggs hatched because they weren't treated, uh, typically because it was an inorganic or if it was an organic means of harvesting. So they didn't use any of those toxicities to it, but that's, that's what you've got to deal with. Now we looked it up. You can eat, <laughs> you can eat that. It's not going to be, you know, it's not. <laughs> You can eat it. Yeah, we. Yeah. It, it, yeah. Did we eat some? No, we were going to, and uh, you chose that we would not do such. Right. I kind of probably freaked out. Yeah, but yeah. it is totally. It, it's totally. It's. I guess it's a protein. I guess I don't. I don't know. It's a bug. <laughs> it's uh, probably protein. We've ate far worse. Right, but yeah. So there's that, right? So you have to think about how long you're going to have this flour for. That's another thing people were buying in bulk was flour because they were baking all the bread or whatever. So you have to think about that. What kind of um, how long you might use that flour or how long it might be before you use all of it. Otherwise, you Or divvy have... it up among a group of people. Right. Or you might have weevil flour. Right. Okay. So there's that. Think about storage. Um, also, think about the humidity in your home. Humidity makes food stale. So if you have a high humidity, if you live in a high humidity area. And turn, turn sugar into a giant block. Turn sugar into a giant block or cotton candy. Right. Um, yeah. So you have to think about that, too. Um, that's how food gets stale. People think that something gets dried out because it gets stale. No, it's because of humidity. The moisture got in there, got stale, and that's what happened. And uh, that, you know, you're wasting the money by buying in bulk, thinking you're going to save money, but yet in the long run, you're wasting it because you bought too much and couldn't use it and you don't use it adequately, and then it goes to waste. So we need to be smart about things uh, like this because we've all done it. We've all seen it on sale, thought, okay, this is what move we're going to make, and doesn't work out as well. Now, with some of this dry storage, let's talk about using can, like half-gallon can jars here that we can utilize, and that's going to keep the air out. Right. So you can use half-gallon or, yeah, you can use half-gallon storage jars, and it does keep the air out. It does keep food fresh and something that you definitely want to to do. Um, so it works for us. Now you can store anything from rice, pasta. Um, if you buy pasta, you probably just want to leave it in the box 
and make sure that if you're buying it in bulk, you use the first, uh, first out, first in. Is that right. Cool? Yes. Yeah. So if you have, if you buy, say you find a really good deal on pasta, but you already have three boxes of pasta at home, you buy that pasta, just put it in the back, and then you're using the stuff that is in the front. That's how you usually typically want to do that. But something like dry beans, legumes, I like to use barley in a lot of soup during the winter, um, and lentils, and I will buy those in bulk from the organic food co-op. And um, that's something that I store in the dry, in the jars, quart jars usually. Um, so that is something that you want to do. And then you want to think about how you're going to freeze it. Meat, if you buy a big pack of meat and there's only two of you in your house, right. you're going to want to separate that and then freeze it in a freezer bag. For about six to nine months, it's going to be good and not freezer burn. Um, and then something like veggies, most of them need to be blanched or parboiled. Okay, go over those terms because people may think, oh, we just harvest it, throw it in a bag, put it in a freezer. That simply is not how you properly long-term storage these things. Right. So, um, yeah. So what you want to do is veggies. So parboiling or blanching. Parboiling is like the older term or whatever, depending on where you live, what have you. So basically what you're doing is you are going to take a hot – so you're going to take your vegetables, whether it be beans or carrots or whatever, prepare them however you want them chopped, and then um, you take hot water, you put – that vegetable in the hot water for usually about two to three minutes and then you put it into an ice bath and it's going to stop that process that's the key you got to heat it boil it put an ice bath stop the cooking of it in order for to make that work well and work right right so that is yeah so that's the that process um and then that's how you do the the parboiling and then you want to freeze it until whatever portions we usually do like when we do our green beans we do about two cup portions right because that's what works for two of us we use freezer bags now there are there's going to be food storage bags and there's freezer storage bags you want to get the freezer storage bags that i think they're just a little bit thicker yeah they, they're designed to withstand the more the temperature uh, change in the freezer um and then sometimes we will double up mm-hmm. on it just to add another layer mm-hmm. of um of protection on that so uh, a couple of things there. Uh, what about fr- uh, uh, freezing fruit? So fruit can be frozen. Now, if you say you find a really good deal on whatever, strawberries, peaches, I don't know, uh, blueberries, and you're just using them for like smoothies or something like that, you don't necessarily have to um, do like what's called a flash freezing. Because it's not for like a long period of storage. Right. You're going to pretty well, rapidly use these up or what? Yeah. Or like flash freezing is when you take... And you lay the fruit out on a cookie sheet, okay, and and then you put it in the freezer until it's frozen, and then you put that in a bag, and that's just nicer if you're going to use those um, berries or fruit or whatever for I don't know, like a dessert or something you want right. to look nice. Now, obviously, if you put fr- you know you fl- flash freeze the, the strawberries, and then you put them in a bag and put them in the freezer and you pull them out, they're not going to hold their shape; they're going to deflate. The flavor and the value, volume, the flavor and the juices are still going to be there, uh, but the 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 firmness of a strawberry you picked fresh is gone. Right, but what you're going to do is say you want to use them for a dessert. You're going to pull them out, put them in that dessert, and then they're going to thaw, and, and that's how it's going to be. Right. Yeah. So that's just some of the things in which you should be aware of when it comes to buying in bulk. Be smart about it. Know if you have a source. Uh, and you can use it wisely, and it really, if it really is cost effective, if it takes you a year and a half to go through a five pound bag of flour, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. To buy twenty pounds because it's a nickel cheaper per right, pound. Right. So uh, just because it's on sale, I tell Holly this: just because it's on sale doesn't mean you have to buy it. And if you don't buy it, you've saved the money on anything. Mm-hmm. So that that's what uh, that's what you need to do. Right. Well, thank you for taking time out of your day to listen to our show. This show is our 26th show of 2020. Did you miss last week's show? We talked about growing great garlic and common diseases and problems for trees. Our guest was author Maria Coletti. You can listen to that show by going to your favorite podcast or platform and searching the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener podcast, or we'll make it even easier. You can send us an email to gardentalkradio at gmail.com, and in the subject line put show 26, and we will send you the link. 
We will be right back. Do not go anywhere. We'll be talking about uh, freezer meal tips. And you are listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, a program to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, help your trees grow better, make that grass look greener, and preserving what you grow for indoor and out. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Do your trees look sad? When we here at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardens have a tree or shrub issue, Dr. Jim's is the product we reach for as it is the product that works. It really provides results. Their small batch, extra potent blend of readily available nutrients is exactly what your trees, plants, and bushes need to regain their health and stay bug free. It's super easy to use. It feeds the microbes and adds new life to your soil. So you can grow stronger plants, chemical-free, environmentally responsible fertilizer that works. It will put a smile on your face and your plants. To find out more about Tree Secret and other products, visit drjims.com. That's D-R-J-I-M-Z dot C-O-M. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. At Big Elk Garlic Farm, they are passionate about their garlic and take great care to provide you with the best seed stock around. Their high-quality garlic is non-GMO. They stand behind their product 100%. Get your garlic for this fall's planting at BigElkGarlicFarm.com. Do you tweet? Send Joey and Holly a tweet to at TWVGShow or just use hashtag TWVG and they will tweet you back. Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center offers an awesome selection of high-quality garden and landscape products. We have just the plants you're looking for. Annuals, perennials, veggies, herbs, and more. Plus, you can always count on us to answer all of your questions and offer expert advice. Blue Mel's also carries the largest selection of bulk landscape materials in the area. Enjoy a beverage from our coffee shop while your kids run around in our huge playground. Join our growing list of highly satisfied customers. Visit the garden center that offers everything you're looking for. Visit Blue Mel's today. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Neptune Harvest, Happy Leaf LED, Drip Works, We Grow Indoors, Deer Defeat, Harvest More, Blue Ribbon Organics, Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center, Chip Drop. Find all sponsors at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit PowerPlanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. So in the first segment, we talked about buying in bulk. We're going to talk about freezer meals, freezer prep, how to go about building the inventory in your freezer and doing it the best way possible to get the most space available that's in your freezer, how to get the most in there. Right. So. Yeah. You're. Oh. Yeah. I don't hear myself. Oh, you can hear. I can hear you just okay. fine. Yeah. <laughs> Real radio. Real radio. So let's talk about uh, the freezer meal tips here. Well, first of all, let's let's I'll throw this tip out there. Um, this came from YouTube channel. They're over in the UK. They have very small kitchens, very small freezers. So what they do is, if they're not going to can like tomato juice, but they're going to freeze it, you get a orange carton or a milk orange carton. juice carton. Yeah, yeah. And then you cut the top off, mm-hmm. and then you put your bag in there and you fill it up. You let that, and then you put it in the freezer, and you freeze it inside of that carton, and then you seal it back up once it's frozen. And then you have a cube. And you have a cube. You pull it out, and yeah. then you can stack them like blocks in your freezer instead of, you know, some people will try to lay it flat, and then it gets all wonky inside the freezer, and things slide off of it. But that's one way to maximize your space by cubing juices in bags. That's one thing. So that kind of helps you out. Uh, family size, it all depends on the size of your family, on... uh 
how to go about doing such things. Right, and that that goes back to kind of what we talked about in the first segment <clears throat> is how big your family is. You you might freeze depending on the size of your family, you might freeze more, you might freeze less based on how many people are in your household. So that's something to definitely consider. Um, you can also do something, and I do this, where say I make us a big uh, pot of chili or big um, crock pot of soup. I will freeze the leftovers a lot of times because, well, chili leftovers we usually use. But if it's something like soup that we're not going to use, I freeze the leftovers. Okay. And so then that way I might have lunch for later or whatever. So that's something to keep in mind, too. Or you could double a batch if you're going to cook something and you want to double it. And then you can have something for for later. So, if, yeah, freeze the thing. Freezer space, uh, we talked about, uh, but we'll, we'll review it again. It's uh, very important on how and what to put in the freezer. Right. So, yeah, so you want to think about that, like, do I have room for this? Um, do I need this? Do I, do I need this? Uh, yeah, like, our freezer space becomes a premium after August, and then as we eat things we've frozen, then it becomes less and less. And then we have more space. So I might do, like, we might do some freezer cooking come winter. And it's nice to cook during winter extra because it's colder outside and you don't mind being in the kitchen as much. And, you know, with, with uh, you know, we uh, we can't, we freeze our green beans. We don't can them. We don't pressure can them. That's how you're supposed to do such uh, because it's the safe way to do it. I know some of you still water bath can, uh, but that's uh, your choice in order what you want to do. Uh, we free, freeze them, so we have to really pay attention to how much space we have, and, and we've got more beans now than we know what to do with, which is a good problem to have. Uh, however, you know, you got to keep that in mind. Right, for sure. Um, so then another thing, another tip is if you're going to freeze like a pasta dish, you want to, under, and you're just strictly freezing that, you want to undercook it because you're going to essentially cook it again or warm it up at some point, and that's going to to cook the noodles a little bit more. It'll cause it to overcook if you uh, do that. Um, Another thing to consider when thinking about freezing your meals is maybe there's a meal that you like, but it's not ideal for freezing. So maybe you do something like instead of meatloaf, you do like meatloaf cups, and you make the meatloaf, and you put it in the t- muffin tins, Okay. and you make these individual little meat lumps. Right. Personal. <laughs> Personal. Yeah. Right. And then you can freeze those and it's delicious. So that's an idea. Um, and then you can do, if you like meatloaf and mashed potatoes, you can certainly freeze mashed potatoes. That's not a problem. But that gives you an alternative to the, um, and I've, I've seen them where they take the meatloaf and they like kind of put the meatloaf in the tin and then they put right. the potatoes or cheese or what have you. It's a thing. Well, that's the other thing. You bring up a point where, you need to undercook because you have to cook, and if you cook it all the way and then freeze it and then you warm it up, you've overcooked it and you've turned everything looky. Right. The only thing I wouldn't recommend doing that with would be chicken. Okay. Yeah, chicken you want to cook all the way through before you freeze it. Well, yeah, for the yeah. safety purposes. Right. Um, so, yeah, so you want to think about what people in the household eat. If you are like, I found this freezer cooking cookbook or whatever, Pinterest, I don't know, whatever. But the people in your household aren't going to eat half the foods, then then it's fruitless. Donate. Right. Donate the cookbook. Not, Donate you know, the cookbook. Yeah. Well, if nobody's going to utilize the meals that are in it because, half, you know. But, you know. I mean, people get excited. They see these recipes. Well, they yeah. Excited. They want to try stuff. And, yeah. Um, so label stuff. Yeah. Because. You play what once, what was this? Yeah, because it's got some fr- frozen freezer crystals on it. And you're right. like, is this. Super. And, and then, then the fun part is, <laughs> you put it in the sink because you want to guess what it is later, you let it thaw out, and it, it's even worse. <laughs> it's like, you know, when did we run over a rabbit in the street and then put it in a bag and put it in the freezer? I don't remember doing that, but apparently we must have because that's what it looks like and smells like. Yeah. So you want to label, put the date on it, label it, and here's the thing, label it and put it in a bag that's supposed to be for freezer. Don't use the El Cheapo bags you bought on sale that's only for sandwiches. No, yeah, for sure. You want to use the freezer bags. And not just food storage bags, but freezer. It, it says freezer bags. on there. Yeah, it'll say freezer right in your face. So, yeah, that's something that you want to use is the freezer bags. Now, some good dishes are like chicken dishes, as I had mentioned, whether that be like a casserole, 
um, some sort of like soup, chicken soup, whatever. All of that freezes really well. Um, and then pasta, Italian dishes, or just like stroganoff, um, pasta casseroles, those are good too. And soups, soups usually freeze well. And also casseroles. Now you can freeze, you can freeze like, I don't know, maybe you make a chicken pot pie, you have extra, you can freeze that. I don't know how well it thaws out, but you can definitely try. Right. Well, a couple of years ago, we had excess pears and we made the pear. Oh, yeah, yeah, we made a pear, pear pie. pie. Yeah. And I don't, did we, we didn't bake it. We just put all the ingredients together and then slid it in the freezer, in a yeah. freezer bag in the freezer. Pulled it out, baked it, and was fine. It was a smaller pie. It was, a, yeah, 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 it was a smaller pie. But it was good. Yeah, so that, that is, uh, what we can, what, uh, can be done there. Yeah. Uh, so, thaw before cooking. This is important because it's, you take frozen, put it in a hot oven, it doesn't equal lovely dinner. No, because it can get kind of gross. Yeah, so you want to thaw it before cooking, unless you find a recipe that says that, you can cook it from from frozen. Like, you know, what you're preparing to put in the freezer is not what you're getting those ready-to-make meals at the grocery store where you take it out of the freezer, pop a couple of holes in the plastic, and slide it right in. We're talking totally different uh, way of going about preparing a meal. Right. Yes, correct. So you have to think about that as how you're going to heat it up. Now, you can portion, you can portion stuff out. Um, I've done this with anything from lasagna to... Enchiladas where you portion them into a portion for yourself and then you have a quick lunch. You would pull out of the freezer in the morning. By lunchtime, it's going to be ready to, to be heated up. Right. So we talked a little, we talked about putting the uh, juice or the, the liquid in a milk or juice carton. Uh, people will also lay them flat. The only problem with doing the laying flat, like I talked about, is you get the irregularities of like if you're, Freezer is slightly tilted. That's where all, you know, it's going to be a big lump on the one end. And also, maybe the freezer bag doesn't seal all the way or you've overfilled the freezer bag. And as it freezes, it pops open and then you've got a mess in the freezer that you've got to clean up. Yeah, that could be a problem. So it's, uh, it's a, a difficult um, mess you got to deal with there uh, when it comes to that. Now, there are devices in which you can, you know, like Tupperware, there's, there's, canning, uh, manufactured, freezing yeah. plastic Tupperware, right? There's free, well, there's freezer lids Okay. Um, for jars, so you can use that. The but glass is, jars. Yeah, yeah, but there's also these little, like, plastic jars right. that have – they're made by ball or right. whatever, um, and they are for freezer use, and we've used those. And there's a line on it where – the fill line. Yeah, there's a fill line. Because of expansion. Mm-hmm. And uh, you don't want to. Do... Now, here's the other. Let's talk about. We've got a little time here. Let's talk about you making your own chicken broth and some of the challenges in which you know it's it's a great way to make your own chicken broth or your own vegetable stock. And and, and if you want to talk about how to do that, uh, real briefly, because some people there's a lot of people out there listening. Go, oh, I've, I've made it since '46. I've made my own chicken broth. But there's some people in this new age of self sustainability because of the situation we're in. People like you can make your own chicken broth. You can make your own vegetable stock. How do you do that? Well, let's talk about that and then how we can store it in the freezer or or other places in that manner. Okay, so we've done this and we've put it into to jars to freeze. And for some reason, even when we, when we leave a, like to the fill line, it just the jars crack. Right. And I don't know why. Do you know why? No, no I have no idea. No, I. And these are certified. Canning mm-hmm. jars, freezing jars. These but, aren't like some pasta. No, El, El Cheapo yeah. mayonnaise glass jars from 87, you know, that type of thing. These are actual things. So anyway, um, how, how do we make both of these, the chicken stock and the vegetable stock? Sure. So, yeah. So what do you mean? How do you make it? Yeah. How, for somebody who's listening going, you can make your own chicken stock. Oh. You know, how, how, do, how does one go about doing such? So we take, um, we take chicken bones that we've eaten, I mean, not eating the bones, but eating the meat. Rotisserie chicken. Yeah, rotisserie chicken or whatever. And we freeze them until we get like a, a quart size bag full of these chicken bones. You can even go to a gallon size, whatever you got. And then we also take our vegetable scraps, whether that be like carrot ends or... Um, it don't have to be pretty. It doesn't have to be pretty. Uh, onion peels. As long as it's not rotten or spongy. Right. These are solid pieces of vegetables. Yeah. So anything that's just like excess, whether like I had mentioned the um, 
the garlic peels, onion peels, carrot ends, whatever you might put in your compost that is not going to be rotten or spongy, put that in a freezer bag, kale stems. Um, so you put that in a freezer bag as well. Once that bag gets full, you dump both the chicken and you can just with just vegetables too. You dump that into a pot, cover it with water, add some salt, add some pepper, um, maybe more garlic if you want more garlic, mm-hmm. whatever you kind of want to flavor it with. And then you let that cook and I've let it cook for a whole afternoon and then you strain it out, especially if you, um, are concerned about any little bits of bones. I usually end up straining it twice and then you freeze it. And you can do this in a jar or you can do it in a bag. Now, can you safely can the materials? You can 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 chicken broth. Yeah, you have to use a pressure canner. Okay. What about vegetable broth? You can can that too with a pressure canner. It has to be pressure canned because Mm -hmm. of the uh, low acidity. Right. Yeah. Okay. So a couple of things there when, when it comes to freezer meals and a little lesson on making your own vegetable and chicken stock. Right. So, uh, well, and another thing we need to be aware of is summer is getting close to being over based on where you're at in the country. Uh, kids are virtually learning now, and the nights are getting chillier, but uh, still a little bit of time left. And let's be honest, you've forgotten about some things, and that may be one thing is your yard. And your yard loves you, and you shouldn't forget about it. No, just because it's fall, we don't want to forget about our yard and those stinking Japanese beetles either. They may be gone, but they're not far. Not only did they feast on your roses and berries this summer, they laid eggs in your turf so they can start again next year. Take a stand with Phylum's Grub Gone. Grub Gone is a non-chemical BT granular that specifically targets scare pests and their larvae. You simply apply the granule with a spreader, irrigate it into the soil, and let the naturally occurring bacteria do its job. Not only is Grub Gone easy to use, but it is the only non-chemical choice that is effective towards grubs controlling. After And the best part of it is non-toxic to bees and other pollinators and beneficial insects. In fact, Grub Gone has no label restrictions for use around flowering plants such as dandelions. So you don't have to get on the ground and pick those out before you apply it so the bees don't take that back into the hive and destroy the hive. You can find all of this out and their other products they have available, Grub Gone plus more, at phylumbioproducts.com, the natural choice. That's phylumbioproducts.com. How do you spell that? That's P-H-Y-L-L-O-M, bioproducts.com. Do not go anywhere. When we come back, Green Living Guru Rob Greenfield will be with us. This is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show. Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener's phone lines are always jammed during the show. So Joey and Holly keep their phone lines open 24-7 to help you. Call anytime, 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-7469. Or just remember, 1-800-927-SHOW. S-H-O-W. Leave a message and they will call you back. Planting conditions are always favorable with the Power Planter Earth Auger. No matter what the job is, Power Planter has the right size for you. Simply attach to a drill and let the Power Planter do the work for you, creating holes fast and efficiently with ease. Find the size that fits your project at PowerPlanter.com. Pomona's Universal Pectin is a high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar or honey to sweeten. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Also available at natural food stores and online. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. Brought to you by Blue Ribbon Organics, providing locally made organic compost and soil blends for gardens, farms, landscaping, and more. Visit blueribbonorganics.com or call 262-497-8539 to find their products nearest you. Trim Bin turns any chair into a workstation. Comfortably sort your herbs, dried flowers, cannabis, and more. Easily collect pollen with the static brush and mirror finish collection tray. High walls keep your work contained. To get yours, visit harvest-more.com. Made in California. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Phylum Bioprop, Dr. Jim's. 
MI Greenhouse LLC, Green Gobbler, Water Hoop, Seed Savers Exchange. Find all sponsors at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com and thank them for their support. Yes, yeah, summer is getting close to being over, but that doesn't mean the jobs in the yard are getting completed to your liking. So if you need some more bulk material, sand, gravel, wood, chips, compost, maybe you're topping off the raised bed to plant garlic this fall, Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center has that. They want You want to do some landscaping, get some consultation done, Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center can do that for you. You want some mums for your porch, patio, or deck, or plant them in the ground, Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center has those now, as well as some fall decor. You can find all of that at Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center at bluemills.com. You can go and visit them at 4930 West Loomis Road, just off of Layton and Greenfield, or you can call them at 414-282-4220. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit PowerPlanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guest for the week. Rob Greenfield is an American adventurer, environmental activist, an entrepreneur. Before embarking on this journey, he lived a typical lifestyle where he focused more on materialistic things and his financial wealth. His goal at one point was to become a millionaire before the age of 30, but he decided to watch some documentaries, read some books, and that changed something in his life, something huge. So Rob, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. It's nice to be, uh, nice to be talking with some fellow Wisconsinites. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely. So you are very passionate about the zero waste lifestyle. What is zero waste living for people who don't know? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I'm passionate about living zero waste, but I'm just generally passionate about uh, doing everything we can to try to, you know, not destroy the world and instead benefit the world to live in a way where we add quality of life to the people around us, to the other species that we share the earth with. And, uh, you know, try to minimize the number of ways that we're, that we're causing harm and destruction and such. And, um, yeah, zero waste is something that I got into early on in my, uh, journey towards living a more sustainable life. And the concept behind that is just simply in all of our actions, uh, doing them in a way where it doesn't result in us having to put something in the garbage can, um, but instead results in us putting something back into the earth, uh, for example, composting or being able to repurpose and reuse things or buying quality things that last a really long time. Just, I mean, the idea of zero waste is just looking at every way that your life interacts with waste and finding ways to, to close that loop and not, not uh, throw things in the landfill and make it someone else's problem. Yeah, and I think that that whole thing, I grew up on a farm, and we didn't throw anything away ever. There were shelves full of pieces of metal and wood. There was always, you know, well, we may need it in about 14 years, so let's save this. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, uh, that kind of started there. When What can an urban food gardener do to help reduce their waste? I mean, we we talk about this being a you know global problem. It's not just, well, somebody else will deal with it. How can each one of us make our little imprint better? Well, that's a really good thing for a lot of gardeners is that zero waste actually is something that for a lot of them kind of comes as second nature. Uh, the compost bin is absolutely the most, maybe the most essential part of zero waste. You know, up to 25 to 50% of people's garbage can is things that can be composted. So a lot of gardeners are already composting their, you know, their food scraps and their yard waste, but they can make sure to compost their paper and their cardboard. A cotton t-shirt can be composted. Your hair, when you cut your hair, um, paper towels and napkins, you know, anything that can turn back into soil, we can turn back into soil. But the other big thing is, you know, food packaging. One of the greatest ways that we create garbage is through the constant buying of packaged food at the store. And one of the greatest ways to prevent that is by growing your own food, by supporting local farmers, uh, buying food locally. And so I would say two of the absolute central tenants to reducing waste come 
just as a complete, you know, go hand in hand with growing your own food. Um, and then if you do buy food at the grocery store, which almost all of our gardeners do, a big thing is finding one that has a bulk food section, especially like local food co-ops, which there's quite a few of them around Wisconsin and Madison. I'm up in Ashland, Wisconsin at this moment visiting my mom, and here we have the Shawamigan Food Co-op. So finding stores where you can bring your own containers and fill up grains and herbs and teas and even your liquids like olive oil and uh, apple cider vinegar and, and so on, even your soaps you can get in bulk at a lot of these stores. Well, also you talk about what the materials that we're buying. What we've done different in our garden this year, instead of taking the old plastic sack that we get from every store and, and harvesting that way, we've got baskets that we use or crates. So we're not even maneuvering bags or, reuse, you know, we, we avoid bags to begin with, but we're using baskets and crates to harvest instead of just throwing it in a bag like we used to. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's just a, it's just a matter of, you know, one of the best things to do is look in your garbage can, see what's in there, and then really just use critical thinking as to, okay, here's what's in my can, what alternatives are there to do this in a way that doesn't result in something in my can. Well, how can people start living sustainable? Uh, sustainable? Well, yeah, I mean, again, it's so great to be speaking with gardeners because we get that. Like that is really for so many people the thing that changes their lives and often results in them looking at, at everything. Food is a big part of it. So if you're especially like here in Wisconsin, we, we eat a lot of meat and a lot of cheese, a lot of dairy. And one big one is to make sure we're not supporting um, these factory farms, which unfortunately today most cheese and most meat in Wisconsin is produced with factory farms that really don't have Wisconsin soil and water and air in mind and our future generations. So, you know, we have CAFOs coming in, concentrated animal feeding operations, and there's actually one that there's multiple that are trying to get in up here in northern Wisconsin, and those can cause massive destruction in such a short period of time. So making sure to support uh, local regenerative farming for dairy and for meat, uh, you know, you know, is one thing. The big thing is another thing is you know, figuring out how to spend less time sitting behind the car wheel and spending more time biking and walking. Um, if you're a, you know, as a gardener, you can actually get a trailer that you can hook up to your bicycle and you can put your shovels. I've I've had a trailer that I've carried up to 150 pounds of weight on, uh, just going around town. Um, so those, you know, those are a couple things that come to mind. And I'm just going to mention one thing. I actually, when I decided to make changes to my life, I actually made a long list of changes that I wanted to make. And um, my first, in my first few years, my goal was to make one positive change per week. And in, in uh, two years at one positive change per week, that's a hundred changes. And I made a list of all those changes and then some other ones on my website, just robgreenfield.org slash 100. There's literally a list of tons of positive things that we can do. That's awesome. Um, so you spent three months last summer in Wisconsin. Well, you spent the whole year of, of last year growing and foraging 100% of your own food. You didn't go to the grocery store or anything like that. You spent three months last summer in Wisconsin, uh, consequently as well. Could you talk to us about that journey, that whole year of growing and foraging your own food? And obviously that was one of your goals. What were some challenges? What were some things you learned? What were some things you probably wouldn't do again? Was there anything that scared you? <laughs> anything that maybe scared you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I know we don't have two lines, so I can't get into quite all of it. But um, the idea behind it was, you know, our, our global industrial food system is broken. And I wanted to see, is it possible in, you know, the time that we live in here in the United States to step away from this broken food system completely and actually grow and forage all of my own food. So no grocery stores or restaurants, nothing packaged or processed. That included no going to friends' gardens or the farmer's market or a farm either for the entire year because I wanted to learn how to grow or forage every ingredient that I needed. And it was a great year 
Um, over the year, I grew 100 different species in my garden, and I foraged over 200 species in nature. So almost a new species for every day of the year. And I, I, I mean, I actually went into that as a rookie gardener with very little experience. I had only had a couple of four by four foot raised beds in San Diego before starting that. And so I, I, when I started this, was researching like how much plant, how much water do you put on a carrot seed or how much sunlight does kale need? Just the absolute basics. And I went from starting from scratch and knowing very little to 10 months after 10 months of preparation, launching into my year of growing and foraging all my food. And I was based in Florida. Um, so we have a different situation down there. Um, you know, year round growing up here, you have to, you have to store a lot of food if you want to be able to be self-sufficient. And, um, I did spend three months in the summer getting out of the Florida heat and just coming back to my homeland and learning the plants that I grew up around. And, uh, it was, it was beautiful up here. There's in Wisconsin, we are in such a blessed state. There is hundreds of species of food growing freely and abundantly, both in the wild, in our public parks, and in our garden. So many of our weeds that we're fighting against are actually some of the most nutritious things in our garden. And I, for sure, that's a big lesson that I'd recommend to people is learn what's growing already, that nature's doing all the work and you can just benefit and work with nature. Awesome. So we're, we're talking with Rob Greenfield and he is um, an eco guru. So now what would you say is the challenge, the biggest challenge of this current generation, like millennials and Gen Z in concerning the environment and the waste for food? Uh, where's maybe possibly the disconnect? And do you think we're getting better at this problem or do you think we're getting worse at this problem? Well, one of the big challenges that we have to deal with today, both my generation and really all generations that are, that are alive today is that we live in a time where most of most things have been made, made very easy and very convenient. We can get almost everything that we need uh, with a click of a button, or with, with the swipe of a credit card. Uh, you know, most of it today can be delivered to our doorstep. And so it's allowed us to live in a way where we are so disconnected with where things come from, how they get to us, what the impact they have on our community and the greater community that is our global humanity. And so it makes it so easy for us to just not have to think about the reality behind our actions because it's been designed that we don't see the reality of our actions. So the challenge is overcoming that and really acknowledging our actions and then, you know, really just having the motivation and the time to, to go deeper and then decide does that way of life really match our values and our ethics? And if not, you know, questioning that system and seeing if what we really want is to step outside of that so we can really live in a way where our values are, are in action, where our actions are in alignment with our beliefs. And to answer your question as to whether things are getting better, in certain ways things are getting better. I mean, we've seen this giant boom in the United States of people – growing their own food this year with feed companies having all-time record sales, selling out in a matter of weeks at the beginning of the pandemic. And we've seen, you know, more and more people getting out on bicycles and wanting to get away from cars. And we've seen a lot of positive things, but the reality is, is that in many ways our trend is definitely globally continuing towards more plastic, more fossil fuels, more consumption. So, you know, it's easy to get into a bubble and feel like things are just getting better, but it's also important to look at the reality of the situation. And basically what I would say is that whether things are getting better globally does not have to affect whether we grow more of our own food, ride bicycles more, love our neighbors more, connect with people, share resources, and do the best that we can. If things are getting better, it's a great reason to do the best we can. And if things are getting worse, it's a great reason to do the best we can, live great lives, and help others around us to do so as well. Well, yes, and and you talked about a little bit earlier uh, what about motivation. But what can we? What can you tell people who are motivating to make changes in their world, but don't know where to start 
or are afraid that if they begin to do it, they will get ridiculed by their friends or family? Yeah, well, I would definitely say a couple of things. One is start where you are. Don't look, I mean, like, you know, you just called me, I think you said environmental guru. I don't consider myself that, but I'm, I know other people do. So whatever you do, don't listen to me and, and like say you got to start where I am. I started back at square one in 2011. So you have to start where you are. You have to embrace where you live, where, you know, the situation that you're dealing with, the you know, the family that you have, um, how old you are, your physical capabilities, um, your monetary capabilities. You have to start where you are, not where anybody else is. And then along with that, start small. See, the thing is, people look at the future and they forget that you'll never get to that future point without making it one step at a time. So don't like, don't put yourself down for making small steps. The key is making one small step. And when you've completed that one, you make another small step. And when you've completed that one, you make another small step. Just like gardening, you get a little better, you grow more food, you grow more food the next year. And you can do that with all of these aspects of, of living more sustainably. Another suggestion is Start with what you're most excited about. If you're excited about food, start with food. If you're excited about zero waste, start with that. If you're excited about, you know, community-oriented action, helping others grow their own food, start with that. Do the things that you're the most excited about where it doesn't actually take energy, but it actually gives you energy. And by doing this, it creates a just a feedback cycle of motivation, of positive endorphins that helps you, you know, do do more and more and more and just build that foundation to eventually get to the life that you, you might be striving for. Fantastic. It's been really nice having you on the program. Um, so where can people find out more about you? Yeah, you can just join me on social media. I, I have a lot of videos on YouTube, youtube.com slash Rob Greenfield, uh, gardening videos. You can follow along my year of growing and foraging all my food. And then just type in my name, Rob Greenfield, into Facebook and YouTube and Twitter, and you'll find me there. And my website is just robgreenfield.org, and that's a pretty infinite uh, source of, of, of knowledge for living sustainably. Uh, for people that are, you know, wanting, they want to know where to start, that website has got the information for you. Well, Rob, we greatly appreciate the time you've granted to Holly, myself, and all of our listeners and the information you've shared with all of us, how we can all be better stewards of the land and the little place that we live in each one of our worlds. And I greatly appreciate all the great work you're doing for the people of Wisconsin and all the inspiration and education you're spreading. So thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And when we come back, it's going to be your garden questions, our garden answers. This is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show, a program to help your garden grow better. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. The number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, rootmaker.com has the answer. From seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants to multiple gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds. Rootmaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit Rootmaker.com. Use coupon code TWVG at checkout and get 10% off your entire order. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit PowerPlanter.com. Protect your plants against damage with a 3-in-1 plant guard and special blend fertilizer. Visit ivyorganics.com. When it comes to bulk landscaping materials, Blue Mills Garden and Landscape Center is where everyone goes. Whatever the project, we have the materials you need with over 40 varieties to choose from. Soils, mulches, gravels, decorative stones, fresh cut sod. Blue Mills has these products in stock and ready for easy pickup or fast delivery. So what are you waiting for? Now is the time to get your yard back into shape. Stop in and pick these materials up or call us for delivery today. Nobody does bulk landscaping materials better than Blue Mills Garden and Landscape Center. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-422. 
The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Neptune Harvest, Happy Leaf LED, Dripworks, We Grow Indoors, Deer Defeat, Harvest More, Blue Ribbon Organics, Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center, Ship Drop. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool to find the right size for your digging project. Visit PowerPlanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. You've got a question. We can help you with that. You can get that question submitted to us by emailing us at gardentalkradio at gmail.com, gardentalkradio at gmail.com, or you can give us a call 1-800-927-SHOW, 1-800-927-SHOW. Had a handful of questions come in this week. Kylie, we'll start with this one. What is the purpose of curing squash, winter squash? So curing winter squash is basically... Where just like you cure any other uh, vegetable, you're just going to put it in a cool, dry, well-ventilated area. And what it's going to do is it's going to thicken the skin a little bit. And then it's going to make it so that it's going to store a little bit longer. We've done this, and we've had squash last, like, what, nine months? Yes. Yeah. So, now, also, now, also, nine months, that's about the limit because yeah. things start getting soft and dried out inside. So it gets a little questionable. Yeah, yeah. But, but it can be done. When you get to the eighth, eighth month, you're probably going to put that in some soup versus uh, some sort of But it's still fresh. edible. It's still edible, yeah. So, yep. Um, so, Donna asks, my pumpkin vines didn't do well this year for many reasons. Would you recommend composting the vines or simply toss in the green bin for pickup by the waste management company? Uh, throw it in the waste uh, for the pickup or just throw, it, just throw it in the trash. Don't even give it to the waste people for composting because without knowing what the plant actually had on it, uh, you know, the trash is your best option. And if your city won't let you put it in the trash, put some trash bags on the bottom, put the plants in there, put some trash bags on the top, hide that sucker, <laughs> and uh, make it disappear because you don't want to infect other people's compost if you put it in the city's municipality and pick it up uh, and they keep it warm all winter long and then that disease gets picked up and brought somewhere else. And you certainly don't want it in your yard by putting it in your own compost. So uh, make it disappear. Um, yeah, that, that's the best answer. So, uh, Holly, how to deal with powdery mildew? I know this is a whole segment in, in itself, but we'll try to give you the abbreviated cliff note version of how to deal with this. What is it, first of all? First of all, there's a whole generation that doesn't know what cliff notes okay. is. But that's okay. So, powdery mildew is a fungus, essentially, and it's, it's a mildew. So what happens is that this happens on your broadleaf viney plants like squash, uh, pumpkin, grapes, grapes, cucumbers, cucumbers, what have you. So what happens is that you, you it's, it's caused by high humidity during the day, cooler temperatures at night with still high humidity. So you're going to get it right now. Um, typically at near the end of summer, the humidity goes up in the evening. The plants don't necessarily dry off properly. It's still cooler out, but then during the day, it's still warm, still some humidity. And so therefore, this is what causes the problem. And so one thing you can do is you can look for disease-resistant varieties. You can remove up to 25% of the foliage from the plant. You can spray the plant, whether it be with, uh, because you want to break up that powdery mildew. So you can use something like vinegar, uh, diluted vinegar, we've used diluted milk, diluted baking soda. Um, all of this will break up that mildew. And then what, cause the reason powdery mildew is bad is because it, it doesn't allow the plant to photosynthesize. So you want to break up that, that mildew. Right, that powder is material, yeah. yeah. Okay, I have three zucchini plants, and the flowers seem to all be males. I have no zucchini to speak of. What is going wrong, and what can I do to get something before the end of the season? Sure. So this is what happens. This is what happens to zucchini plants is they put out the male flowers first. They want to know that they're going to get fertilized so that the, they'll put the female flowers out. So what you want to do is you want to tap the middle of the flowers it's going to make that happen. It's going to put out the female flowers, and you should have You're beautiful. stimulating the plant. Right. You're stimulating the plant, and you should have beautiful zucchini. Hopefully. 
Uh, if that's not the case, there may be other uh, problems with the type of soil. It may not be getting a certain nutrient, which will prevent it from putting on fruit uh, on the plant. All right, Holly, here's a question that maybe a lot of our listeners are facing right now. It's too early. It is now too early for pumpkins to be ready, correct? Well, it depends on when you plant it. That's part of the question. Uh, I have one that is full orange and seems ready, but I don't want it to harvest it right now. It's, I want to keep it on the vine as long as possible because it's not that time of year yet. What can I do? Can I leave it on the vine or do I need to harvest it because it will rot if I don't? Okay. So if it's not, okay, if it's a jack-o'-lantern pumpkin, like a legit jack-o'-lantern pumpkin, um, they don't do so well. They're only going to last womp, about five to, five to ten days. <laughs> but if it's on any, the vine, on the vine, on the vine. Okay. Yeah. If it's any other variety, you can harvest the pumpkin and it's best to harvest it. Take it off the vine because then you're going to prevent pumpkin rot uh, from sitting there. And it will last 8 to 12 weeks. 8 to 12 weeks. Well, we've had them last uh, 14 months. Yeah. Uh, now, we didn't eat that pumpkin. It was a white pumpkin that we found the fall, like like early November one year, and we held on to it almost two years because we went and did talks at schools and stuff. And we brought this white pumpkin. No, I guess it was it was uh, almost a full year. I, I take that back. It was a full year almost before that pumpkin completely kind of fell in on itself. And But the kids thought it was cool. It was a white pumpkin. They never seen such a thing. Right. So that being said, we are out of time. And we thank you for yours. Did you miss any portion of this program and you want to revisit it? Well, you can do two different ways in order to capture, recapture that information. One, you can go to our website, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com and clicking on the season four tab at the top of the page. You can catch on, catch up on past episodes as well as the season one, two and three tab. Or you can send us an email at garden talk radio at gmail dot com and we will send you the link to this program. And if you miss another uh, past show, we can certainly help you with that. Tell your garden friends and your fellow gardeners that this program's on the air. That's how this show is spread, as well as podcast replay and in-studio video replay. Join us next week on the program. We'll be talking about what should you be doing right now in your garden. And if you're not doing that, what about this? And our guest will be Jackie Beyer. One, uh, she's the host of the Green Organic Garden podcast and will answer your garden questions. That's all next week. So for Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird. Until next week, we will see you in the garden. <laughs>